Hello, and welcome to day two of Future Fest. We are incredibly excited to welcome you um, to what promises to be an incredibly inspiring series of talks featuring a range of incredible architects from around the world, each from A plus award winning firms and bringing their own unique stories to tell. This celebration of architectural innovation is a perfect way to warm up for the 11th annual A plus awards launching this October. Stay tuned for more details on that in a little bit. Um, and if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. If you've attended any of our previous live talks, welcome back. We're excited to have you all with us. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Hannah Feniak, and I'm the architecture editor at Architizer. Throughout the next three weeks, I'll be sharing hosting duties with my colleague, Paul Keskes. Today, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to chat with Rob Rogers, founder and principal of the A-plus award-winning firm, Rogers Partners Architects and Urban Designers. Today, we'll be discussing architectural innovation at all scales and creating more livable cities. While we wait for the room to fill up, I want to encourage you all to say hi in the chat box on the right side of your screen and to let us know where you're from. It's always really exciting to see such a global audience of people logging in from places where I assume everyone else is asleep. Um, in the meantime, I'm gonna share a brief video that provides a glimpse of what you can expect over the next three weeks. Let me just bring up my video here. <laughs> How can architecture be a force for good in our ever-changing world? In the face of environmental upheaval, political turmoil, and unprecedented health crises, architects are being challenged to adapt. They must now react not only to the needs of clients, but also to climate change, economic turbulence, and the evolving needs of local communities. How can design address these complex issues? What should architecture look like in the next decade and how should it function? What role can architects play in making the world a more resilient, sustainable and equitable place for all? During Architizer's Future Fest, we'll be asking some of the world's best architects, each one an a award-winning designer, for their answers to these questions and more. They'll offer insights on the future of architecture at every scale from the design of cities and urban environments, to buildings of all typologies, to the material details that bring architecture to life. Here's to the people behind the projects who are shaping better architecture for today and long into the future. So if you're interested in uh, learning any more about any of the other talks going on in the next three weeks, I encourage you to go to architizer.com. Uh, there we've pinned the article with the schedule to the very top of the page so that you can see the full list of speakers with the names, dates, and times of each talk, and a little short description of what each speaker will be covering. Um, you can make notes of your favorites or register to past events in order to access recordings of talks that you may have missed. Uh, now I'm just going to share a few quick pointers about how our live platform works. Um, so if you're ever having any technical difficulties with your stream, you can click on the help icon in the bottom left corner of your screen and you'll see a few different options for improving your picture, the sound, and all other things that you might be having trouble with. It's also worth noting that there will be a recorded version of the talk, which will be sent to your email afterwards, so you can catch up on anything that you do miss if you face any technical difficulties. Um, you can also free, feel free to forward that email to colleagues and friends after the event so that they can register and watch the talk as well. Thirdly, if you have a question that you'd like to ask Rob at any point in time, uh, please click on the questions tab in the lower right hand corner of your screen and then type your question there. Um, you can also scroll through the questions in that tab um, to see if there's anything that someone else might have asked that you'd be interested in hearing the answer to. If so, you can upvote that uh, question and I'll look at 
which questions are kind of generating the most interest. And I'll take that into consideration when choosing which ones to ask. Um, now, finally, um, allow me to introduce um, Rob Rogers. <laughs> Drawing on more than 30 years of experience in blurring the boundaries between urbanism, landscape, and architecture, Rob founded Rogers Partners Architects and Urban Designers in 2013. Major civic and institutional works include the award-winning Henderson Hopkins School in Baltimore, the new St. Pete Pier in Florida, and the recently completed, completed Craft Hall at Rice University, um, as well as the Nanotronic Smart Factory in Brooklyn Navy Yard. Current large urban plans are underway for the Hub 404 Park in Atlanta, Galveston Bay Park, and a reimagined President's Park in Washington, D.C. Rob has also worked with commercial clients on significant projects that impact the public realm such as the elevated acre on 55 Water Street in Manhattan, the New York Stock Exchange Secure Streetscapes, Battery Park City's North Neighborhood, and Sand Ridge Commons in downtown Oklahoma. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic over to Rob. Um, I'm so excited to see what he has in store for us today. Great. Thank you, Hannah, so much. It's really a pleasure to join you, and I think we all you know, celebrate Archetizer and in special ways as a amazing communication tool for our profession. So I'm delighted to join you on this live format today. Um, and the St. Pete Pier is the, the first project that I was gonna talk about, which won the A plus award this year. We're really delighted with that. Um, I'm trying to control it with my buttons, but I'm not getting that, Hannah. Let me try. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to ask you to turn because it's not jumping on my buttons. Okay. Great. If you say slide, I'll change yep. it. <laughs> okay. Slide. Um, so we're going to talk today really about projects that are essentially infrastructure. And I like to introduce them by saying, is it, are these projects architecture, landscape, or urban design? And the answer is yes. So starting with the St. Pete Pier slide, which had a long over 100 year history started really as a industrial railroad pier slide and began to become socialized and deal with ferry service slide until it grew into what was called the million dollar pier which had a casino and dance halls and it actually become part of the social fabric of st petersburg this pier burned down slide and was reconstructed as an inverted pyramid in the 70s which began a slow, long kind of tired transformation of a retail environment as a, at the end of this thing, yet it held this iconic place in the heart of downtown St. Pete and it really in the culture and history of St. Pete slide. But in essence was a kind of a glorified restaurant at the end of a causeway. And it was kind of like, well, you go there on Mother's Day or when somebody graduates, but it didn't really participate in the culture of the city. So when there was a competition to replace the pier, uh, we formed a team, Slide, with Slide, with Ken Smith, a uh, landscape architect, and said, you know, even though the town felt like this was an iconic thing, the fact was it was really an object at the end of this causeway. And we felt that a appear as part of a 21st century piece of infrastructure really needed to be an experience in its entirety and what was iconic would be the experience itself but not necessarily an object and this is go ahead slide and among the competition schemes where was the only one that actually took all of the vehicles off and instead of this singular route created this multiple various routes that began to address people of all ages, all abilities, and all attention spans, in fact. And we coined the term, whether you have 50 cents or 50 bucks, you ought to be able to spend a day at the pier and make this an extension of the entire waterfront park system slide. And that meant re-engaging the relationship with the water and the pier. So we wanted to get up and we wanted to get down and we wanted to touch the water and embrace the water and invite educational opportunities. Next. 
And so the pier, we splayed apart, creating multiple routes, multiple kinds of experiences, different ways to deal with the water that also left uh, much less dark shaded coverage, which is how we got this crazy thing permitted through the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and so you can see the, the storm waters managed in the coastal thickets, which are those kind of buckets of landscape that, that have boardwalks on them as you walk out and goes from the mainland out. You can also see the, in, on the left-hand side, the breakwaters that were installed that enabled the beach to form and be maintained. So you actually have a place where people may come and engage Go to the go to this little city beach with small children and never even engage the rest of the pier. So it was really about how do you make this piece of infrastructure become a viable park space slide. And so this is looking across the entry plaza up to what we call the tilted lawn where kids roll down um, and you can get up and see the view and begin to have these kinds of anticipation. One of the things great working with Ken Smith is very much about the poetry of the experience so that what are you anticipating and it and it breaks down this quarter mile walk into these segments and pieces of experiences that engage you as you move out along the pier slide. And so at the main plaza we've got these great water spray jets which are both a civic fountain, but also an amazing playground and way to wash off next to the beach. And critically, there's facilities available uh, throughout. There's always a place to escape if you've got a summer thunderstorm. There's a place to get in the shade. There's moments throughout the pier where you can actually step into an air-conditioned environment so that you really can occupy the pier throughout the year in all weather and all environments. And we, we called it we called it a simple idea shade cover comfort slide and so that's evident in here there's a fantastic city council had to change its charter to allow alcohol in public parks so we put there's a, a wonderful bar and pizzeria that are part of the facilities around the fountain slide um, and umbrellas that that are implanted in the lawn so that you can really take occupancy of the park personally and individually in so many different ways slide and as you begin to move out we had long discussions with the city about shared space realize convinced we're convinced that when you let bicycles and pedestrians and strollers and rollerbladers and everybody actually occupy the same space there's much more respect than when you begin to isolate them into lanes or designated pathways next and so you have opportunities to move along the boardwalk going out to the the uh, native the ecological education center that's halfway out slide and controlled bodies of water so that you actually get down and in, around and over. And the thinness of the bridges actually lets you really have the sense of experiencing yourself out and over the water. So different than the kind of causeway bridge that was there before. Slide. This is the education center, which has a great sort of amphitheater that steps down where they actually do work directly in the bay. This is run by Tampa Bay Watch slide. Part of the landscape as it as it goes out, it's all a native landscape that that then takes the storm water from the bridges itself and filters it so it doesn't go directly into the bay slide. And you can get a sense now how much this is really engaged right into the heart of downtown St. Petersburg. And it has uh, become so much a part of the experience of downtown. The attendance, even though it opened during the pandemic, the attendance is almost triple what was originally projected. Uh, it's been incredibly exciting to see the success of the pier slide. The next piece of infrastructure I'd like to talk about, and it, and it really is infrastructure, 
um, is a, a project dubbed Hub 404 in Atlanta for a major new regional park slide that, you know, born of a city of, of highways like Atlanta slide and actually uh, uh, thinking about how you use the space of the city slide especially a city like Atlanta, which, you know, Atlanta was built at, at around railroads. It's the only major city in the United States that's not on a major river. Um, and so how is this influence, this kind of transportation influence, the character of the city and its public spaces slide? And this is in North Atlanta, Buckhead, um, and the Georgia 400 Highway was built kind of right through the middle of this portion of Buckhead and you can see completely separating it and the MARTA rail line which is the commuter rail is actually in the middle of the highway so it's even wider and farther apart in terms of separating these fundamental neighborhoods. Next. And so this is a place working with the Community Improvement District in Buckhead, um, as well as the, the major jurisdictional agencies. It's really an incredible opportunity where you're on the Path 400, which is part of the whole regional effort to develop pathways uh, and pedestrian ways and bikeways. I, I, many, I imagine many are familiar with the Beltline. The Path 400 connects into the Beltline. We're on the Georgia 400 and the intersections of Lenox Road and Peachtree Road. So we're at this kind of automotive hub at the, in, within Atlanta. And we're on the MARTA rail line. So it's this incredibly multimodal opportunity where the, the congregation of all of these activities take place. But in fact, there's no there there in that sense. Next. And so we, when we look at, at this examination, you also understand that uh, Atlanta actually has one of the more extraordinary uh, urban canopies, tree canopies, but it has some major gaps. And as you can see on the map on the right-hand side, this is one of the major gaps in that. So when you're talking about, um, you know, urban heat islands, ecological continuity, all of those things that would be repaired by pulling that urban canopy back into place are part of what we're looking at um, slide. And we're delighted on this project to be working with Thomas Waltz and Nelson Bird Waltz, landscape architects, a very collaborative co-thinking effort at, these, at this exercise. So we began to under, try and understand this site it's very unusual because it's it it's all privately owned land. There's no roadways or right of ways adjacent to the highway. Everything is by special permission and easement. And so we said, well, what we really need to do is is not just cover the highway, but actually make these strategic connections that link the neighborhood groups together, link the pieces together, and tie into that regional trail system slide. And in fact when you're making a park, how much space do you really need to make a park? And we began to imagine not covering everything, not creating a complete tunnel slide, but actually strategically linking the sides and pieces of Buckhead together. And that means we're not creating a tunnel. So from in terms of capital costs and long-term maintenance costs, you don't have mechanical ventilation. You don't have fire suppression. You don't deal with the egress, the lighting, and all of the things that go with a, a highway tunnel slide. And so we began to, to say, well, programmatically, what do we need to create public realm and park space over here? And so we program for a commons area, a place to gather, to have major functions that can serve the community and the region as a whole. Um, that you would have a plaza space that's a little harder, it's tougher, it can take the abuse, it can take big crowds. Um, where do you go when you win the World Series? Where do, you, where do you go to celebrate these kind of civic events? And then we need gardens. We needed a place that uh, 
you can park your stroller and sit down and read a book. You can meet a friend for lunch. You can engage intimately and personally with the park space and with each other. And then we thought we'd link it all together with an alley of trees that restores the urban canopy, but also provides shade and a, a sort of structural link all the way through the different programmatic pieces slide. And so this is the Hub 404 project with Peach Tree on the lower part of the screen, Linux Road on the upper, really a, a, a sinuous linear park that links and connects strategically all of the fundamental pieces uh, uh, adjacent and, or, and around throughout the region. And because it's sitting on the Marta line, you're actually serving, you know, 400,000 people within a 45 minute ride and walk uh, for all of the Atlanta region slide. So we're building up and over the, the, the trains and the highways. And in some places it completes like this, like a bridge next. Um, but in, in essence, it has almost a, a half mile distance. So you really get an extraordinary experience of this public realm within, within Bucket itself. Next. Um, the alley we talked about, which sits on top of the structural touchdown points where we can actually have the depth to have major uh, landscape elements slide. Um, yet it also has these oculi that are open to below, which keep it from being a tunnel, but also give you a, sort of a punctuation of your place in the city slide. Um, and that, that center plaza place where you have uh, can gather and collect. It's hard. It's kind of tough. It takes emergency vehicles. It can take food trucks, right? It's a, it's a place that's, that's made for flexible use slide. And just as importantly, those oculi are part of the experience from underneath so that the train station uh, below begins to have its whole identity tied to the public realm above slide. And even those in the stay in their vehicles get an experience to begin to understand that there's a space here, there's a place here, there's something to engage, slide. Um, and so we really imagine this would be the kind of the, the future of the way infrastructure evolves in the city where we've got MARTA engaged, we've got the Georgia Department of Transportation, we've got the city, we've got community interest groups. It's a big collective effort to create a multimodal space that serves the entire city uh, as a whole, becomes even a destination place. And within the context of, of the economic analysis, we're looking at almost $2 billion of, of development that would be supported by the construction of the public space. Um, and this is the way we think that that infrastructure needs to evolve in the United States. Next. The third and last project, um, our office, sometimes we call it the big crazy, uh, but this is the Galveston Bay Park uh, slide, um, which is in Galveston Bay next to Houston. Um, and as you may know, an incredible story of hurricanes and history of storms on the Gulf Coast slide is very unusual. This is a project we're working with kind of as a, a grassroots think tank, uh, primarily with the Speed Center and Rice University, but with academic partners and professional partners uh, through, from throughout the region. Um, and this is outside of the Army Corps of Engineers work on the Gulf Coast because it's really specific to uh, different kinds of modeling. And I get into that maybe in the Q&A section even next. I have a, give a little bit of history. This is, this is Galveston Bay, one of the largest natural estuaries in the United States with Galveston Island and Bolivar Peninsula being the coastal barrier islands separating the bay from, from the Gulf of Mexico slide. And the or I have to get into a little bit the origin story of Houston. Uh, in 1900, Galveston was the third largest port in the United States, and it was completely obliterated in a hurricane of 1900 
a storm surge came ashore of over 19 feet. It's actually one of the largest natural disasters in the history of the United States, over 9,000 people killed. Um, and it essentially ended uh, Galveston as a, as a port city slide. So what did they do? Houston, they decided to make Houston the port and they dredged a channel through Galveston Bay and moved the port to Houston. And that ship channel opened in about 1914, slide, which happened to coincide within one year of the opening of the Panama Canal. So now became critical shipping hub for the Gulf of Mexico, the last American port before you go through the Panama Canal or the first American port when you come through the Panama Canal slide. And in 1914, oil was discovered at Spindle Top in Beaumont, Texas. And so Slide, Houston, became the sort of the center of American petrochemical uh, industry. Right now, it's almost 25% of the petrochemical activity in the United States is associated with Houston, 13% of the refining capacity. Uh, there's over 250 petrochemical plants. And this is all in that upper portion of the, of the bay slide. Hurricane Ike in 2008 hit Galveston and Bolivar Peninsula with an almost 17 foot storm surge. This is the Bolivar Peninsula, essentially wiped clean in 2008. That's when the Speed Center started working on hydrological modeling of hurricanes uh, in the Gulf and in Galveston Bay. And we joined the team about four or five years ago, beginning to think about how to deal with the response to these major storms, slide. And since Ike was a category two storm in 2008, since 2016, there have been 10 Cat 4 or Cat 5 storms. And so even though there's an Army Corps of Engineers project underway, they're dealing with methodologies that have to do with Category 1 and Category 2 storms as the highest average. And our friends at the Speed Center and with the other academics are really saying that's not the ultimate risk. And we need to be thinking about the ultimate risk because the economic and environmental damage of a major hit in Houston could be the greatest catastrophe in the United States history. Next. So one of the things they did is they started studying Hurricane Ike and the dotted line is where Hurricane Ike came through. Basically, the eye went right over Houston. The worst of a hurricane is actually, if it was a clock face, is usually around two or three o'clock on the clock face. And what the Speed Center learned is that if Ike had been 25 miles farther to the west, that the storm surge into the upper portions of the bay slide. You know, this is, this is what Ike did. It created about a 15 foot surge up into the ship channel. And that's about what facilities are protected to. Um, so it's sort of, right at the limit. In Texas parlance, that's like having your ear shot off any closer and it's all over, slide. And so if you moved that Ike 25 miles to the west, you would have had 25 to 30 foot surge all the way up the ship channel and into Houston. And to understand not just the environmental damage, the human loss, but the, the you know, any, any of these chemicals and oils are gonna ride on top of the water. So a flood that's an inch deep is just as dangerous as one that's three feet deep uh, because it's gonna carry these things throughout the entire region. So we find the risk to be extraordinary, slide. And working with Rice University and a series of graduate students have actually been trying to quantify and understand. And of course, one of the other challenges is that Houston is not just a petrochemical port, it's also a container port. So you've got all of these containers stacked everywhere. You can imagine they just become battering rams in a hurricane surge slide. And the population centers, all of the workforce that is in these areas and within Houston and Harris County itself, and Harris County's over four or five million people and there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of them within coastal 
uh, low-lying areas slide. So our proposition is to actually construct uh, an, a new archipelago of islands within Galveston Bay that line the Houston Ship Channel and pr provide hurricane protection for the vast majority of the facilities and the population associated with Houston and, and the port slide. We are working collaboratively with the Army Corps, who's got a project in the in blue three four and five for a series of sand dunes and a major gate to be constructed on galveston island and bolivar island and this is a this is a good plan but it's going to take about 30 plus years about 30 billion dollars um, and the dunes need maintenance and by our projections the dunes can be overtopped by a category four category five storm and and our proposition is that that's actually the risk that you need to consider. So we're looking at constructing this series, thank you, go ahead, in, into the middle of the bay and creating it as a public park so that it actually becomes accessible. And when I talk about 21st century infrastructure, it's, it's in that sense. So the way we're gonna construct this slide is to actually create the islands with a series of, of gates that can then be controlled and closed. Uh, and these gates are well within the size that the Dutch have, have built and performed. So we know that we're, we're workable and constructible, slide. The other thing is that the ship channel is, is only 530 feet wide and it needs to be widened. Uh, both for the safety and operation of the ships, but also the capacity of the new supercarriers that come in with the, the major container ships slide. So our proposition is to actually widen the channel, which is economic development and environmental safety, and use the material to create the series of islands and, and berms on, on the other side that will protect the city and the region slide. And when they originally dredged the channel 100 years ago, they just dumped that material adjacent to the channel. So we'll be operating on area that's already been disturbed by dredge. It's not on, on virgin bay bottom. Then you correct the barrier, you bring in the habitat, it comes in slide. And in fact, a portion of the project already exists as dredge spoil islands. So we love to say that that we're sort of inheriting a project that's already got 25% of it complete slide. Um, then we install the navigation gates, sluice gates. We're doing work with the speed center on understanding salinity and oyster production, the impacts of the changes on the on the on the water performance. Um, so it's it's really a a, a broad project trying to understand uh, the nature of of resilient infrastructure slide. When we started the project, we examined, you know, the, the black lines are hardened edges. So seawall, sheet pile, riprap, essentially eliminating the functioning filtration edge of this major estuary. So we'll be replacing now with over 10,000 acres of new habitat to bring the quality, water quality back and the habitat up next. Also, because the special origins of Texas, even as its own nation, there's almost no public land on Galveston Bay. The red line indicates private ownership. So the bay is really inaccessible to the region as a whole. And again, this would be 10,000 acres now of new fully accessible waterfront space within the bay itself, slide. Um, so we'd be constructing a really like a levee with a, a highway and access point on it and then a series of wetlands and, and soft grounds that could be used for camping and horseback riding, slide, um, all the things that you'd want to do in a public park, but it's built to 25 feet high, which means it could take a storm surge of a Cat 5 storm uh, on, a, on the worst pathway in, for Houston and its region, slide. Um, we're working with different ecologists and scientists talking about uh, different living breakwater systems, uh, shore edges, 
places actually even with the Army Corps so that we can accept maintenance dredging materials over the next hundred years, which has been a really complicated and difficult issue within the, the bay itself slide. And so you can imagine everything that you love in your own national park is the things here. It's a, one of the on one of the major bird migratory bird flyways in the United States, uh, and all the ways that you can celebrate a sort of waterfront island park slide. And when I mean celebrate infrastructure, we really mean celebrate. Take a lesson from the Dutch, who they operate their sea gates once a year, and it becomes a giant party. And really understand that we've got infrastructure here to protect Houston and Harris County for uh, the next hundred years, but it's something you can use and occupy every day because it's there as a part of the social structure of the city slide. And really imagining, reimagining Houston and Harris County as this waterfront seaside community. And uh, we're super excited about it and it's kind of maybe we would talk about it in the q a but i i love to talk here about how architecture is is not just about form but it's actually about thought aggregation and one of our roles is to really bring together a lot of different kinds of expertise to try and put together something that's that's got equity issues access economic development uh, habitat creation you know and and it becomes a major regional contribution. Hannah, thank you. Thank you so much, Rob. That was an incredible talk. Um, and from the diagrams that you brought to the images, to the historical background, I'm, I'm just blown away. <laughs> I've read a bit about these projects, um, but having, having that much background and that much uh, kind of in-depth knowledge is really, truly incredible. Thank you so much. Um, so now we have time for the Q&A period, um, and I'm going to be choosing questions um, from the question tab um, that's in the lower right-hand corner of everyone's screens. We've already got a few questions there, so if people would like to continue adding them, I'm going to be keeping an eye out here. But I'm going to start with one um, that someone asked that actually um, was a question I was having as you were um, saying kind of from the very beginning, which is, uh, considering the complexities of each of the projects um, and how they consist of the micro to the micro with all the historical and natural constraints and informants um, with the concepts being simplified and both simplified and layered um, what kind of how does the first consideration become formed um, and wh where do you start what drives the project at the very beginning of it <laughs> before all of these complexities start to layer in that's from Eric Barnard that's well <clears throat> i guess they all start in different ways the the i'll go backwards but like on on galveston bay park the speed center and walter p moore the civil engineers who were involved and involved with the speed center they had evolved the, the hydrological models to understand the risk and once they understood the risk they realized well, what do we do? And they began to think about a gates and series of pieces and looking and, and they had arrived at the idea of this dike along the Galveston, uh, along the, the ship channel through the bay when they got us involved and said, well, we, we think we have this dike, but we don't fully understand what we're going to do or if we have to maintain it or use it. And, and we got involved and said, Paul, oh, it can be so much more than a dike. We can actually create space and make public access. And that's when we sort of studied the, the perimeter of the bay and those pieces. And so that has really evolved from a early idea of engineering solution to one that has really become rich and dense with all the other layers of uh, ecological uh, creation, really habitat creation, as well as, as social spaces for the population. And it continues to evolve, very complex. Um, interestingly enough, something like Atlanta, they'd actually done a feasibility study for a cap, uh, kind of like the, the, the park in Dallas. And, and that was there. And when we took a look at that one, it was sort of like, well, I don't know why you'd 
do an entire cap because in fact there's no public right away on the edges and so you're you're abutting everybody everywhere which becomes really complex and then we realized you could pull it back and then you'd also not have a tunnel it began to be both strategic and economic and i think that that's the point when when ideas begin to take reality is when an idea is not singular it's not about structure it's not about uh economics it's not just about you know land ownership but all of a sudden you begin to see four or five layers of solutions coming out from a particular direction um, and i think that that's that's probably the the essence of how a major project grows and they only get more complex actually um but it 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 starts with when you begin to overlay several ideas that begin to point you in the same direction Thank you. Yeah. And um, this kind of, I guess, ties in, I'm going to ask Paul actually had a question that relates to one I have that kind of dovetails on what you just said, which is, as those layers are becoming more and more complex, um, quite often, is it uh, your firm and your team who are pulling in these other experts when you talk about consulting with um, ecologists, for example, at Galveston Bay Park? Um, and are you kind of finding these people that you're connecting with and building these conversations and what does that look like? Um, and then kind of, dub so I guess this is a question about collaboration as is Paul's and Paul is, al Paul is also interested in how Rogers Partners works with engineers for a public project as large as the Atlanta hub and how early in the process they would come in to collaborate with you um, for the course of the project. So I, I, I think that they're two related questions in the sense that we're both interested in the collaborative aspect too. Yeah, well, there, there are two. I'll, I'll start with Galveston Bay again, which is very interesting. We've got, besides ourselves, the Speed Center, which is really hydraulic modeling and civil engineering. We have professional civil engineers from Walter P. Moore. We have an environmental attorney. We have a, a retired, petrochemical economist who's working with us. We have a sitting Houston City Council person on our team, as well as the two of the landscape architects that are part of our office. And so it really is a kind of broad, because all of those issues are at play all the time. And so that's a weekly meeting with the kind of strategic brain trust where do we go from here? Who do we need? We're missing this. What do we do? How do we talk to the core? What's next? Um, for Atlanta, it's kind of an interesting story because when we, when we won the project, um, we were told that the other two teams were both led by internationally known engineering firms. And how on earth were we going to select this architect and urban design firm from New York instead of one of these major engineering firms. And I said, because you don't have an engineering project, what you need is you need a vision, you need an economic plan, you need to understand, marshal your allies, get everybody together, face in the same direction, and eventually we will have an engineering project. And it's very interesting because we're now at that point where we will, we've been primary and built the team including consulting engineers landscape architects uh everything but that team will now probably to tradition uh, transition contractually to a major e a lead who will actually be helping with the design and engineering of everything over the highway and we will continue to to take a team of specialists, which will include ourselves and the landscape and some specialized civil and structural design and lighting. And, and we'll manage that team kind of on top of the team that's building the structure over the, over the park. Um, and that's a little bit how we did St. A lesson we learned from the St. Pete Pier. Uh, we had super powerful, wonderful local architect, ASD Sky, uh, that was there to help us uh, manage everything on the ground, but working with Ken Smith and some lighting designers and a few other specialists in terms of curtain wall and other consulting, um, we would be, you know, running the, the kind of the design team um, as it went through. 
Thank you. Yes, I, 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 my takeaway, one of my many takeaways from this talk is that you guys are also experts in collaboration. It's, it's really, truly incredible to hear all the different um, minds that are kind of bringing their expertise into these projects. And I mean, it also shows. Um, another question that's quite popular is um, how to balance between a more livable, between building a more livable place and the constantly increasing population. Population density seems um, seems to be getting larger um, at an un uh, and it's an unstoppable trend. So, can we make how can we make cities that carry more people while becoming more livable? Um, and I'm assuming that this question kind of comes with the way that you're adding green space and public spaces to cities where um, to play parts of the city that people may perceive as being already developed. I I, I think that's where it is. I mean the there's aspects of that question that really deal with, you know, where does density belong, right? And how do you grow density properly? And, and what's transit's role in growing that density? But in these three particular projects, it really has to do with the creation of, of public realm for a density that already exists. So, so it's, it's taking the, the airspace over the highway which is, you know, basically everybody has turned their backs to that to that highway, and we're working with um, owners and developers around those surrounding sites to how you can actually kind of refront some of those properties to engage the public space that will be there. Um, with the with the St. Pete Pier, I think it was, it's about creating public realm, but it's also about creating public realm that is flexible and programmable and adaptable. Um, I think one of the keys to high quality public realm is sometimes there's a tendency to over program. Uh, like we have a playground for little kids. We have a playground for big kids and we have a playground for adults. And we have a small dog park and a big dog park. And, and, and that doesn't necessarily make a better public realm because I think that you need to leave space for flexibility for a festival for a fair for a concert for things to happen so that the public realm effectively becomes a part of the cultural life of the community that it engages um you know you're not really high quality public realm doesn't come to the community it comes of and from the community um, and, it, and it's one of the reasons, like on Galveston Bay Park, uh, we really want to, with, that, with everything privately owned, if you don't own a boat, right, which you keep in a marina or on a waterfront home, which automatically puts you in a certain economic category, you don't have access to Galveston Bay. Uh, so by creating something that's publicly accessible, broadly accessible, in many different ways, you're, you're actually enriching the community that's already there and enabling the densification and the growth that I think the, the questioner was asking about. Thank you, that was a really comprehensive response. Um, and just before I ask the next, next question, I just wanna point everyone's attention to the poll tab, which is next to the question tab in the lower right-hand side of the screen. Um, just so that you know, we've published a poll, and if you're interested in potentially participating in an event like this as an A-plus award submitter, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, simply go to that polls tab in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen and answer the poll that we've put up. Um, you can request a submission guide uh, where you can register for the upcoming A-plus awards, awards, which are launching this October. Um, I'm going to leave that there and uh, turn back to the questions for Rob. We have Peter uh, Wasilko, who's asked, um, specifically he asked this while you were speaking about Galveston Bay Park. Um, he's interested in how you fund a project of that scale. That, that is the uh, billion dollar question. So um, the, I'll start by saying, you know, the Army Corps um, gets their funding through Congress. And so the Army Corps, looking at the coastal defense with sand dunes and berms, um, you know, they work on a legislated methodology, how they do 
risk analysis, cost benefit analysis, and how they put it together, and all of their funding. I mean, there's a portion of it that comes locally, but most of it is is government funded. Ours has been a sort of a grassroots, ground up project, um, and we got some early um, funding support from civic, civic minded foundations uh, in in the Houston region. And we're about to embark on a second phase of study. Uh, and very interesting, a really great question, because the second phase of study now is funded in equal parts by the city of Houston, Harris County, the Port Authority of Houston, and an individual industrial investor, and giving philanthropically. And so we really think that that's, even though that's just this portion of the study, what it's really key that that kind of cost sharing and bringing those different entities together to recognize that what the Army Corps does is good, but it may not be everything that you need. And locally, you have to solve for yourself. What are you actually going to do with risk? How are you going to fund it? How are you going to put it together? And so as part of this next round of study, we're looking at a whole series of funding mechanisms that that come from some governmental support, foundational support, private support. You know, there's resiliency bonds. There's a whole there's a whole series of ways we're looking at it. You've got the economic development aspect of widening the channel, which creates value for the port. You've got protection and flood mitigation, which means you can revise insurance requirements and values, and how do you monetize that to turn that back into a protection program? And so we don't have the definitive answer, but we are using that, that whole team I talk about, trying to understand what are all the avenues, knowing that you, you're not just gonna go to the federal government and ask for a big lump sum handout. The teamwork is key, the collaboration. <laughs> um, I think we have time for about one more question. And one that I think is interesting and could be open-ended, it could be on a personal level, or you could think about it as a firm or kind of more objectively would be, how do you measure the success of your projects when you finish them and when you're looking back? Um, how do you assess what you've built? Um, I think, I'll take the St. Pete Pier, which has been, we were really delighted. Um, it, as I said, it won the ULI Americas Award, so one of 10 projects in the Americas. Um, and we were there with the jury when they visited and the jury met with the city government. They met with community representatives, uh, neighborhoods. Uh, they met with the design team, they met with the construction team and when they came away, they said, wow, um, every single one of those entities was completely positive. And there were even community members, and there were, back when we won the competition, there were community members that were absolutely against a car-free pier. Uh, they were, you know, nobody's ever gonna go there. Nobody's ever gonna walk a quarter mile. That's the craziest thing, you know, it was, and, and those people, now enjoy the pier on a daily basis and it becomes part of their walking regimen and every other piece and i think that that having that kind of community support when the city has the data to come back and say wow we have three times the visitorship we had originally projected um that's what's there and you know there's 50 shots of the pier on instagram every day uh, people enjoy it in so many different ways um, and that's that's how you could look at it and measure it. We like it that it also wins design awards as well as community awards, and and that's hard to accomplish all the time. But I think that's at the the core of our our practices is we're we're not that big, uh, even though these are large projects. But we are uh, absolutely deliberate and and focused about what architecture, urban design, and landscape contrib contribute. Um, and, you know, 
stick with it until it gets there. Thank you so much, Rob. And congratulations again on um, your, the success of St. Saint Pete, Saint Pete Pier and um, all the say. other projects you've shared. I always want to say St. Peter. And it's, I know it's not. Um, and so thank you so much for this absolutely brilliant presentation um, and for the responses to the questions that we had. Um, I'm just, yeah, really excited and thankful to have had you uh, share all of your um, expertise and insights with us. Um, for everyone uh, watching, thank you so much for coming and for participating. Um, we're looking forward to seeing you at the other talks over the next three weeks. Next, um, next up tomorrow, we have um, Mikael Frost of Sebra Architecture, who's gonna be speaking about blending ancient and modern in the public realm. That'll be at 11 a.m. Eastern. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about the A-plus awards, which are um, coming up this October, again, you can just fill out the poll in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, and we'll send you more information on that. Uh, so, yeah, a big thank you to everyone. Thank you to Rob, and um, have a great day, everyone, wherever in the world you are. <laughs> Hannah, thank you so much. And Paul, thank you for the invitation. Thanks. Good morning. Bye.